Uh, so, uh, greetings, dear colleagues. Good evening and good morning, uh, depending on what time zone you are in. And uh, so, welcome to our uh, optical seminar. Um, so, uh, before before we start, I just uh, let me remind you a couple of rules we propose to follow. So, in order to arrange it smoothly, we propose to uh, uh, keep your microphones uh, turned off. Uh, you will be able to switch your microphone. Uh, in order to ask questions, there are two preferred ways to ask questions. Uh, you can either raise your hand uh, in the participant list, uh, or you may also type your question to the chat. So uh, I'm very happy to introduce our today's speaker is Professor Willy Padilla uh, from the Duke University Department of Electrical and Computing Engineering. So the talk is devoted to deep learning for the next 20 years of metamaterials. Willy, please. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to uh, present to you some of our recent work and to at least give you my perspective on what will be important uh, for the next 20 years of, of metamaterials research. And uh, I should acknowledge the people responsible for this work. Uh, my graduate student, Yang Den, uh, who's done the bulk of the work that I'll show you today. Simiao Ren, who's a graduate student working with my colleague, Jordan Mayloff at Duke University. Christian Nadell, who uh, did some early work on our deep learning uh, and uh, is now at a company in Durham working in machine learning. And Bo Hao Huang, who just graduated last week uh, and is looking for his next uh, endeavor. And Kevin Fan, uh, who is now a professor at Nanjing University. And everything I'll talk about today was funded from the Department of Energy under this, this grant. So uh, I'd like to uh, start by just mentioning a few words uh, about our group at Duke University. Uh, we're at this Center for Metamaterials and Integrated Plasmonics Research uh, run by David Smith. Uh, here's just a handful of, of topics that we're investigating. Uh, and in non-pandemic years, uh, we like to have visitors out and, and, and give talks. This shows a, a picture of Nathan Kuntz when he was the CEO of, of Chimeta during that time, a year and a half or maybe two years ago now when he visited. Uh, so we hope to see all of you in the future uh, if you have a chance to come and visit us. And uh, as, as the title suggests, uh, I've been working in this field for some time. David and I uh, have, it's been about just over 20 years now since we, we published kind of this early work on, on negative uh, index. And so um, what I'll try to do in this talk is to give you my perspective of what will be important, uh, as I mentioned, for the next 20 years of, of this field. Uh, so I'll motivate uh, the talk um, with, with two pieces, one talking about ImageNet which is viewed as uh, kind of one of the key things that spawned at least the current wave of deep learning. Um, and then I'll talk about all dielectric metamaterials as to one of the problems that we ran up against and how we use deep learning to solve that. I'll show you some results from deep learning and then show you more importantly, uh, how inverse design can be used uh, for some of these uh, all dielectric metamaterials. On the right, I'm showing here um, a picture that I made in Google Deep Dream. Uh, this uses ImageNet, which we'll talk about in a second, but uses one of their artificial intelligences then to kind of merge two pictures and to make kind of a dream state uh, resulting uh, image from that. Okay, so, so ImageNet, this was the idea of Fei-Fei Li, who at the time was an assistant professor at Princeton. I think she started in 2007, but she had this idea going back to 2006. And what she had noticed is that in the computer vision community, people were mostly focused on models and they had some data, uh, but it was largely kind of an artificial data set. And she felt it was very important to have real images, real things that, that these computers could identify. And so she worked uh, with colleagues then uh, using Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, to make a database of hand labeled images. Okay. And so uh, this was first presented by her uh, in 2009 at this conference on computer vision and pattern recognition, and it uh, since 2010 then became an annual competition uh, to see how well your algorithms uh, could identify um, images in these pictures. So for example, ImageNet is this open source repository of images. There are 20,000 different classes. There's some examples of different classes that you might have. And again, these are hand labeled. So humans go in and, and they label these, these images. And currently there's 14 million hand annotated images. So here's, here are a couple of examples. It's hierarchical, so you can see we have mammal and so on, on down in this top row. And this bottom row, there's, there's then a different list. 
Okay, so so annually, then people would enter into this ImageNet challenge and try to uh, use their algorithm to identify uh, these classes uh, in these images. This is some result. I'm showing the error rate uh, for each one of these years that this contest was held. And as you can see in 2011, uh, the error rate was relatively high. These are a bunch of different entries, but maybe the top one was about 26% uh, error rate. And things changed in 2012. So we can see that there's still a relatively high uh, error rate. Um, and this was kind of viewed as a limit of about 25% uh, error rate. But one group, in fact, dropped that by 10%. And this was the advent of this kind of deep learning uh, approach. And from that time period, then all of the top winning um, results were using deep neural networks. Okay, from that from that time period. So here I'm just showing uh, the data again, a different plot, and just showing the the kind of winner of each of these years. And uh, the color map is showing the traditional shallow networks that were used up until that point, and then the darker purple color is showing you these deep neural nets. And the winner in 2013 made a uh, interesting statement, which is uh, saying that this ImageNet 2012 event was definitely what triggered the explosion of AI today. Okay, so, um, you know, neural networks have been worked on for a long time, since the late 50s and early 60s. And so what, what one can ask, what was different? Why was this different than what had come before? And so in their own words, uh, this, this AlexNet, which won the competition uh, in 2012, had eight layers, five of these were convolutional layers, and they had three fully connected layers, but they identified three key things uh, that were the reason why their neural network did better than what was before, and that is they utilized this uh, ReLU nonlinearity. Up until then, people would typically use the sigmoid activation function, and they used this uh, so-called rectified linear units. It ended up being much uh, faster, computationally speaking, and so here, this is the training error rate as a function of epochs. An epoch is how many times you look at your entire data set. And so they had to go through six epochs. The solid curve is for the ReLU, whereas the traditional approach using the sigmoid took six times longer. Okay, so allowing to go through your entire data set while you're training your neural network is a big uh, bonus. They also did something interesting called data augmentation. So here we have the image of a tiger. Someone would go in and hand label this and draw a square around this tiger to say that's, that's where it is in this image. But they realized based on the symmetry of images that one had in ImageNet, you could simply reflect that about the vertical and have uh, to a neural network a different image. And so with this data augmentation approach, they were able to drastically increase the data size that they were training their neural network with here by a factor of 2000. And lastly, they utilized uh, GPUs for this training process. And so all of these are important because one needs to run through your data set, you fine tune your neural network, and then you do it again. And so if it's taking you know, five or six days using GPUs, you can imagine how long it would take uh, without these advances here. And so it takes quite a, a long time to train these neural networks. Okay, so um, people think that the deep learning and, and generally machine learning is huge and, and is um, absolutely already impacting the world and, and is extremely important. Uh, here's a quote from the CEO of, of Alphabet, uh, of Google. AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It's more profound than electricity and fire. So, um, you know, people think it's important, not only companies, but world leaders. Here's a quote from Vladimir Putin. AI is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. So it is indeed important. Uh, many people view it as so. Um, it is criticized by others as just being glorified statistics. So here's a, a common kind of joke that uh, went around the internet a few years ago, showing that it's just uh, really glorified statistics. Um, and there is a difference, and it's probably nicely summarized from this book, Learning from Data. Uh, the authors are shown here. And they point out that, of course, statistics is uh, learning from a set of observations to undercover some underlying process. That process is a probability distribution, and the observations uh, are then samples from it. Whereas, um, and also, this is a mathematical field, and emphasis is placed on uh, questions that can be answered with rigorous proof. Whereas in, in machine learning, 
uh, you're still learning from data, uh, but you don't have an analytical solution. What you do have is lots of data, and so you can uh, construct empirical solutions. And so deep learning or machine learning is very much uh, the scientific method. Okay, it's kind of learning from data and figuring out uh, some function that makes a connection between observations and results, um, but it's unknown uh, what that connection is. Okay, so I just wanted to then kind of give you an overview of deep learning. There's there's clearly not enough time to to go over it in detail, but kind of a bird's eye view of of the main things of how this works and to define some nomenclature for this field. Because as I or as we've already seen. Uh, I'm somewhat using machine learning and deep learning interchangeably, but I'd like to specify what the difference is there. So people view uh, it this way. Artificial intelligence is kind of this grand thing that we're headed for. Uh, machine learning is then a sub area of research within that, and deep learning is a uh, then sub area of machine learning. And so many people perceive uh, artificial intelligence, um, describe artificial intelligence as any device that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximize its, its chance of achieving its goals successfully. And uh, of course, by this definition, optical character recognition is artificial intelligence, right? It needs to perceive its environment. It needs to find symbols uh, in text, uh, numbers and letters, and uh, it, it can achieve its goals, right? But this is very much a moving bar. Um, nowadays, of course, people think that artificial intelligence is more something like that. It's this idea of achieving some supreme intelligence, uh, in this case, it might be more like uh, have this Android form. Machine learning then is using algorithms to parse this data and to learn from that data and make informed decisions based on what it's learned. And deep learning is then structuring algorithms in layers to create an artificial neural network that can learn and make intelligent decisions on its own. And so the key difference then between machine learning and deep learning in terms of neural net architecture is that deep learning has these multiple layers okay and we'll see in a second why that's important and why it was able to surpass what became before at least in this image net competition okay so let me just now kind of overview deep learning and give you a few basic insights into how this this works so this is uh, the the uh, mnist database which is a, a database of handwritten digits each one of these is labeled by human uh, as to the correct uh, numbers that they are and you can think about a neural network uh, identifying these digits in the following way. If we take some digit and break it up into 28 by 28 pixels, where each one of these pixels um, is then just defining some grayscale value for each of those pixels, that's then a 784 inputs. And each one of those might have, again, a, a grayscale value from 0 to 1. We can take those as inputs to our neural net. Here I'm showing a very simple neural net. All of this comes from this YouTube channel. So if you wanted to learn more uh, about deep learning, this is a very good resource. Um, all of these uh, pixel values are fed into this uh, neural network. This is fully connected. And what that means is that every neuron in every layer is connected to every other neuron in all the adjacent layers. Okay, so we have this fully connected network and uh, you have weights and biases. We'll talk about this in just a second. But on the output, then you want to identify, you want your neural network to identify if it's a zero or a nine, right? zero through nine. And so um, they're using the ReLU in, in this particular example. Um, but each of these weights and biases, then, so if we just consider one neuron, you have these weights, we have this activation function, which we already discussed, and you're summing up all the contributions of all of those weights from, EV, from each of the previous uh, layers' neurons. And you sum that up, and so each one kind of gets a vote if you want to think about it that way. And then you can add a bias term as well. Okay, so uh, since we have hand labeled data, we know what ground truth is. So, for example, we can feed in each one of these digits, feed it forward in the network. Initially, your weights and biases are randomly assigned, and uh, but you can compare what the correct answer is and make adjustments to your weight. So, for example, if it said it was an eight when it's really a nine, you can shift the weight of that one down. Um, but since it's fully connected, every single one of these gets a vote on how the weights should move either up or down. And then you can further then feedback from that layer. So this is called back propagation. And by adjusting all of those weights and biases in this complex network, you can then start to hone in on finding a mapping that will then take you from these 784 pixel values to some output of 10, uh, a dimension of 10, where you're now predicting what this, this number is, okay? And so after 
then so this works and, and after this this uh, deep learning model is trained um, we want it to generalize well okay because one of the problems that plagued the early days of neural networks is that they did not generalize well and what that means is that it would memorize the training set so it could do extremely well on exactly what you trained it on but if you showed it a slightly different seven then it wouldn't be able to recognize that seven if that seven was not in the training set okay so what we need and what you want is generalization and so Google pointed out in, in one of the recent articles that the width of a neural network is memorization. So you do need a little bit of that, but you don't want your network to completely dominate and just have just memorized the training set. You also want generalization. So what Google at least said in one of these articles is that the depth of your neural network is generalization. So you need a little bit of each. Um, in order to find a good neural network that solves the particular problem that you're working on. Now, just a few more words on, on some nomenclature here from this field. The training set is defined as this data that you're using to build the neural network, because initially you don't know how wide and how deep to make your network, to make your network. And so you're using this some particular set of data to train and to fine tune that width and depth um, of, your, of your neural network. The validation set is then data that you're using to um, iterate over the architecture of your neural net. So it's an, it's you get an early measure of performance, but you might use that uh, validation set again after you've retuned the architecture of your neural network. And then the training set is a data set that you have that the network has never seen. So after you go through validation, you might lock down your weights and biases and you have a, a, a well, a good performing neural network. You then show it something that is never seen. So that's the test set and that's the ultimate measure of its performance. Okay, so uh, we're feeding in some dimensions. For us, this will be geometry. We're feeding that uh, as a metamaterial into this, this black box. It's got all these uh, weights and biases, and we might have, uh, for a metamaterial problem, some spectra on the output. And so we're re really learning this forward mapping by having access to all these parameters that we can fine tune by having, in our case, geometry and spectra, okay? And so for the example, one of the examples I'll show you today if you want to think about this as just a huge number of tunable parameters, in our case, we have nearly 6.4 million total uh, parameters that we can use to fine tune um, this neural network that is learning the physics that underlies geometry and its connection to spectrum. Now, it's very much a black box. We don't know what it's doing, but somehow it can learn that mapping between these two uh, different representations. Okay. So um, I'll also talk about the limits of metamaterials because ultimately that's what led us to working a lot on, on dielectric metamaterials. Um, it has challenges which led us then to deep learning. Um, and then that also is somewhat limited. So that then led us to this ultimate kind of thing that we were after for some time, which is inverse design. Then I'll conclude. Okay, so what do we like about metamaterials uh, or at least what do I like? Um, one of the things is what John Pendry told us in the early days and that's that the electromagnetic response is coming from geometry, not necessarily uh, the materials that you fashion your metamaterial or metasurface out of. You get independent and direct control of epsilon and mu. That's very nice for scattering, electromagnetic scattering problems uh, because epsilon and mu enter directly in Maxwell's equations and it gives you nice insight in, into scattering. Um, since metamaterials are composites, uh, you can program functionality into them um, with a bottom-up approach where you're serving multiple functions from the geometry itself. In the early days, in 2004, 5, and 6, when I was a postdoc at Los Alamos National Labs, um, we wanted to make these dynamic, and so we spent a lot of time uh, kind of pushing this multifunctional aspect of metamaterials. The last salient feature uh, that I find useful is that this response, at least for metal-based metamaterials, comes from this meta-atom or this unit cell and not necessarily from the array. Okay, array interactions, at least for metal-based metamaterials, is relatively uh, small or at least manageable. And one particular thing that we are interested in metamaterials is that of absorbers. Um, we've done a lot of work on absorbers. This is a result from 2008. These are experimental results. I'm showing the absorptivity as a function of frequency on a semi-log plot. Uh, this was in 2008. We achieved 99.997% absorptivity in the K-band, and we quickly pushed that in two years on up to the visible. Um, making these uh, metamaterials uh, easier to fabricate as we move to shorter and shorter wavelengths. I should mention uh, that each one of these meta surfaces is backed by a continuous metal plane. And so that's how you can achieve these absorptive states. 
Now, really, uh, absorption is interesting, but um, what we were more interested in at that time was that of the emissivity of controlling the energy from surfaces. And Kirchhoff long ago pointed out that at equilibrium, the emissivity of a body or a surface is equal to its absorptivity. And uh, by way of example, I'd like to talk about lighting. So the incandescent light bulb, uh, which we've used uh, up until recently, where we've now switched to LEDs, is fashioned from tungsten. It has an absorptivity of about 45%, at least in the visible, and it operates at 2800 Kelvin. And so compared to a black body, it might have a emission something like this, shown as this blue curve. That's the radiant excedence, and the way that that's obtained is by taking the absorptivity and multiplying it by the black body spectrum at its operational temperature. Now, of course, this is not good uh, for lighting because it peaks in the infrared and you have quite a bit of waste energy going into the infrared when we only care about 500 nanometer and around that range for, for uh, lighting purposes. So if instead of having an absorptivity like this, if we can fashion the tungsten in some way where we can have a, um, a curve like this in the absorptivity that peaks right at 555 nanometers where the eye is most sensitive, then we can reduce all of this unwanted infrared emission. And additionally, if we have an isolated system, one needs to conserve spectral weight. So all of that spectral weight will go into where it can be emitted here at 555 nanometers, and we would get a peak in emission that grows beyond the black body maximum, okay? And so of course that would be too bright. Um, so it means one can reduce the input power. So if you had a 60 watt incandescent bulb, you can reduce it um, by a factor of 10 and say, let's say have five watts and get the same number of lumens out uh, from this. So does this work? It does. Uh, here's some experimental uh, examples. Um, we're showing on the left, a emitter that's made from a single unit cell um, absorber and on the right, a bipartite unit cell which should have two emission bands. This is experimental data. In both of these subplots, I'm plotting the emittance as a function of wavelength. And I'll show you these uh, for different temperatures. So on the left, you see we have one peak growing out of the background. On the right, we have these two peaks where each one is associated with a different absorber. As I increase the temperature, you can see that these peaks are growing out of the background. And if I stop here at 300 Celsius, now and compare uh, that to the black body at the same temperature of 300 Celsius, um, we then find a curve like this. And so you can see these metasurfaces as appliques to a surface allow you to strongly reduce the energy that's coming out at all of these wavelengths, but instead to put all of that energy into where we have designed the metamaterial to be emitter, an emitter. And so you can divide each of these curves by their black body reference and indeed show that you can have these uh, nicely tailored emissive peaks um, precisely where you would like them. And what we've been interested in is doing energy harvesting with this. I'm showing here as the red open symbols, the external quantum efficiency of gallium antimonide. And so this represents where you can convert photons into electron hole pairs. If you're below the band gap between two and four microns on this plot, you can't convert uh, any photons to energy. And of course you get a peak uh, external quantum efficiency of 80% around 1.6 microns in wavelength or so. And so what I thought would be a good idea is to would be able to use a metamaterial as an emitter where we could simply allow there to be very little emission below the band gap to have a peak emissivity where the EQE peaks and to follow that in a wavelength dependent manner on the high energy side. And as you can see, this is a publication from nine years ago. And indeed it, it works. You can find a decent match to this external quantum efficiency. What's the problem? The problem is that you need this thing to get hot for true applications of energy harvesting. The radiant excedence goes as T to the fourth. Okay, so here I'm showing a plot of all of the elements. Uh, it's a table really showing the melting point and the electrical conductivity. All of the uh, metals that we use uh, for metamaterials, aluminum, gold, copper, and silver, all have relatively low melting points but high electrical conductivities. For the energy harvesting application I mentioned, this is really where you want to be. And you can see that no element gets you to that quadrant. Okay, so for energy harvesting applications, we really need a different approach. And uh, I'll show you that all dielectric metamaterials can indeed go to these high temperatures that we need, um, but new problems emerge. Okay, so just a, a brief word then on all dielectric metamaterials. Um, we know that metal based metamaterials um, can be tessellated to fill a plane or a volume. And we can think of their response as uh, effective magnetic and electric uh, materials. 
and we can describe them with this Lorentz oscillator form. So the metal-based approach is nice to have that. Um, but for the aforementioned reasons, we want a different system. And so what we're utilizing are these me modes or these hybrid dielectric, these hybrid waveguide modes and these dielectrics, where we can think about a uh, dipole type of magnetic response that one can find and a dipole electric response. These are quasi-dipole type responses, um, which are hybrid waveguide modes in this system. And so if you can get those two, we can kind of think of those similar to the metal-based metamaterials, but now we can then make an array out of these cylinders and the radius and height can be used as two parameters to tune these somewhat independently, similar to what we can do with the geometry of metal-based metamaterials. Again, our goal is uh, absorption. And so this shows a simulation where if you can make um, the magnetic and electric mode degenerate and occur at the same frequency, and if you add a bit of loss so that you're um, uh, critically coupled, you can achieve the state of uh, unity absorption. We won't have time to go through the equations, but our analysis shows that the key is to have a radius to height of 1.22 times uh, n over the square root of n squared minus 1. Here, n x of the, is the index of refraction. If that is large, then this reduces to approximately 1.22. And as you can see from this equation, uh, the radius and the height cancel out. And so it has no dependence on anything other than the material that you're making this from. And so just like metal-based metamaterials, you can scale this uh, throughout the spectrum, okay, following this prescription here, if you were interested in absorbers. And so here shows a scale design that we did at 600 gigahertz. The red curve is the experimental absorption as a function of frequency in terahertz. And so this works. And now that we can achieve this relatively narrow band uh, absorptivity, what we like to do is get back to this energy application. We like to think about how we can form a super unit cell from these cylinders um, and to kind of cobble together an emissivity where we can match the external quantum efficiency. So let me just take you through a very simple example of, of why this fails. So here uh, is an example from the terahertz range. I'm plotting the transmission as a function of frequency in the terahertz. And I have a very simple unit cell. It's just one cylinder. Um, I'm showing a, by, a, a two by two here, but we have a pretty boring transmission response. If I scale that smaller, just make every cylinder uh, smaller, we get a vanilla response as well. It's relatively frequency independent. Now, if I do the very simplest thing and make a bipartite unit cell, where I'd like to piece together these two and see what results, I get now a bunch of different modes uh, in my spectrum, none of which were existing in the original two spectrum. Okay, so the plot on the right is just showing a bunch of these modes that exist in these dielectric cylinders. And the takeaway is that many of these modes um, have this evanescent tail that hangs off their perimeter, and which means that we have a significant neighbor interaction, unlike the metal-based metamaterials. Additionally, you have a number of length scales as a result of using uh, these different unit cells. And so you have a lot of uh, non-localized modes that can exist on the surface. Now, we really, really tried to use conventional optimization to make this work like we had done with metal-based metamaterials, but this is highly nonlinear. And so you, one can't just step through this parameter space and find a solution. We tried and failed miserably. And so, as I mentioned, that's indeed what led us to this deep learning approach, okay? So again, back to this problem, what we did is we decided to tackle this two by two unit cell case. We used a, a, a Druda model to model silicon uh, um, cylinders here. And uh, we are looking in the terahertz range. So we took radii and heights from this table here. This would get us uh, some resonances uh, in this range with these radii and heights. All units here are in microns. And we allowed each cylinder to have a different radii or a different height from this list. And so that's actually a rather large space. There's 13 to the eighth total possible permutations, about 860 million. And if we just tried to tackle this problem um, by just simulating and looking for a good result, um, it would take about over 2,000 years to compute that entire space, okay, even on our fastest machines. And so that's not viable. So instead, what we did is to do 18,000 electromagnetic simulations as a training set for this deep neural network. We did an additional 3,000 simulations that we reserved for the test set. Now, let me give you a view of how this works. Geometry is our input. We would feed that into our neural network. And what we ultimately want on the output is to predict a spectrum. So we would have 300 spectral points here, and then we did this uh, kind of process of training this neural network. Now, in, in reality, in addition to these eight geometrical inputs, I showed you that 
the radius to height was kind of a key parameter for determining where uh, these metamaterials, all dielectric metamaterials, would have a high absorptivity. And so if, you, if there is some underlying physics that you know about your system, you can also feed that into your network. Neural networks, as it turns out, are poor at multiplying and dividing. So it takes some number of neurons for it to learn those functions. And so any physics, uh, especially in this form that you know about your system, if you feed it in, then you'll find that you can have a smaller network and you can train much faster. Okay. Now, I don't want to talk in detail about the, the architecture here. Um, I'll just mention that, of course, our output is transmission. That's a causal function. And uh, I did also mention that we were, in the, we were outfitting individual spectral points. And um, of course, these points are independent. They're connected to their neighbors. And so we use both a transpose convolution and a convolution to make that relation and also to uh, smooth the curve here. Let's look at res some results of this forward model. Um, each of these subpanels is showing two things. I'm showing the prediction, which means the deep neural net, uh, what the deep neural net would predict in terms of a spectrum given some geometry, and I'm showing the ground truth, which is numerical simulation at the red curve. In each of the subpanels, I'm also showing the MSC between those two. And so you can see, so this is the transmission uh, as a function of frequency in terahertz. You can see that, uh, see that they agree quite well. You can see the red curve peaking out here. And all of these MSCs, at least what I'm showing here, are of order 10 to the minus fourth, and that's in terms of spectrum. So overall, we find an average MSC of uh, 1.16 times 10 to the minus three, in terms of spectra for a quantity that goes from zero to one, uh, that's a small value, that's 0.1%, uh, so it's quite good. 95% of the data have an MSC less than this value here and 99% less than this value here. Uh, that's on the, the test set. And so as a metamaterialist, I, I found this actually quite surprising that this neural network could somehow learn the physics that underlies uh, this metasurface here, uh, because if you think about it, we only sampled an extremely small fraction of this parameter space Yet we were somehow uh, able to learn this, this kind of forward mapping problem where we could connect spectra to the geometry. So all of that is, is interesting being able to solve this problem, but um, ultimately what we liked about metamaterials in the first place is that you had some insight on how to solve electromagnetic problems. So what's, what's much more interesting than solving this forward model would be to solve this inverse problem. And that is, I would like to specify a spectra that I would like and I would like a neural net or deep neural network model then to tell me here's the geometry that you need to achieve that spectrum. Now this is uh, an inverse problem and it's a it's ill posed uh, in order uh, and for us to understand what ill posed means we need to first understand what a well posed problem is. And it was Hadamard that gave us some nice criteria uh, to define that. He said that a well posed problem should have existence and that is that at least one solution should exist. There should also uh, be uniqueness. You should have only one solution, and it should be stable. That is, it should your solution should depend continuously on the data. So an ill-posed problem, uh, and many inverse problems are ill-posed, is then simply a problem uh, if one of these conditions fails. Okay, and so in 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 just in simple terms, a, an ill-posed problem is like if somebody gives you a present, you and you try to guess what's in this box, right? You have no idea and there's an infinite number of solutions and it could be just anything. So that's an ill-posed problem and the problem that one is facing when trying to solve these, uh, these inverse problems. And so one way to solve that is just by brute force. Again, I mentioned this before, this space that we're looking in has all these permutations, but now that we have solved a forward model, we have this uh, analytical solution or at least this closed form solution that we can evaluate extremely fast. It's about a million times faster than our numerical solver. Okay, so what we can do then is just calculate the entire parameter space. We can do every single possible geometrical permutation. It takes uh, evaluating this function just 23 hours to solve that entire space. It's not that big, it's 2.6 terabytes. Um, and then you can search through that space now by doing a dictionary type lookup at some given, you know, so if you want some spectra, you can search through there and find the closest match, and then your uh, neural net will spit out then the geometrical solution for that. So it takes about 20 seconds to, to find one of these solutions. All right, so here's, here's an example. In the top row, I'm plotting the transmission as a function of frequency in the terahertz. And each of these are showing a hand-drawn spectra that my student drew. And what we're gonna do is search through this entire solved space to try to find spectra 
it at least maps in these, these regions. And so let me take you through this here. Um, we can do that. We get a global optimal solution. So the best solution is the red curve. You can also, of course, find a second best solution and so on. Uh, and then this predicts a geometry. We can re-simulate that geometry. That's the dash uh, gray curve. And indeed, we find that each of these hand draw spectra, we can find good solutions to those by doing this kind of brute force approach. Okay, so this we published uh, a year ago. This is what we had termed the fast forward dictionary search. And it works well to solving this inverse problem. Um, it's, it's not that novel um, and it also fails. And so if you have a metasurface that has a much larger geometrical space, um, then as I'll show in a second, it fails. And what we've done is we've stuck with this two by two example, where now we've allowed the cross section of each of these metasurfaces to be elliptical. In addition, we've allowed them to rotate um, in the plane. And so just adding those two parameters then makes a much larger space. I'm showing everything that I talked about before is on the left and now this new case is on the right. This is now 14 geometrical dimensions, so 14D metasurface. Um, it has a trillion total possible permutations. Even if you had a, a accurate forward model, if you tried to solve that entire space by doing this fast forward dictionary search, it would take three and a half years just to compute uh, every permutation. So this is not viable, okay? So that led us to then uh, what we are terming this neural adjoint inverse approach. And let me describe to you how, how that works. Our forward model, we are training on geometry spectral pairs. And initially the neurons are unlocked in the sense that uh, we're learning from data, right? We have a number of these training examples that we can fine tune um, the weights and biases of our neural network. And our goal of course, is to learn this, this forward mapping. And once we've done that and we're happy with the results, our forward model is accurate, we can then lock down those weights. Okay, these weights and biases can be locked down. And then what we can do is we can feed in a spectra. And so in the sense that's locked, that's something that we're looking for. And we can move backwards across this neural network and think about our geometry as now a parameter which can be guided to the right solution. And so we're very much solving this, this inverse uh, problem uh, by using this approach. And um, the reason that it works, and I'll just tell you briefly how this uh, algorithm works, is that we have this closed form uh, differentiable expression by virtue of learning this forward mapping. And so therefore it's trivial to compute the gradient uh, of that function. And so now if we define some loss, then we can use modern deep learning algorithms to estimate the gradients, which means we know how to move along this geometrical surface and we know which direction to move to find a better solution, okay? And so we use an iterative approach. Um, again, we're looking at the gradient. We have some particular learning rate, um, this alpha parameter, and we uh, go through this iteration. It, it turns out we only need to go through this about 300 uh, iterations before we can find a good solution. And one key here uh, to, to why this works so well is GPUs. Um, we don't just need to have one initialization in this geometry space that goes through 300 iterations we can have a bunch of um, initializations, each of which will move along this geometrical space and each one of them looking for a good solution. There's no cost in time to doing that in parallel. You're only limited by the memory of your GPU. So we find that we can have a thousand initializations. All of them can move along this geometrical parameter space and find very good solutions, uh, 300 iterations, and then we just pick the best solution. Now, a key to this working before, so that our approach to the inverse, um, to solving the inverse model is similar to what people have done before, but we did make a key contribution um, that made it perform better than um, many other inverse approaches. And that's, we added this idea of boundary loss. Let me explain that. In our forward model, um, we're simulating in some geometrical space and we have bounds that geometrical space, right? We have some minimum and maximum radii and height. And what we found is that our forward model Okay, our neural net is very accurate within that space. Um, but outside of that space, you can have uh, wildly varying um, solutions. And so your gradient can also widely vary. And you will always find a gradient, although it's false, you will find a better gradient outside. So uh, outside of the space. And so you're, um, as you're iterating along the space, you will often be pushed outside. So we had a boundary loss that forces us to stay with inside the space where our forward model is accurate. And that ended up being the key difference between this and what had come before. On the right, 
uh, we just had a paper that was uh, presented last week in NeurIPS. This is kind of the, the um, premier machine learning conference. Uh, so that was presented uh, last week at NeurIPS. We were accepted there. And some results here are showing um, just four different types of problems using our neural adjoint approach um, compared to all of these other inverse uh, approaches. And the blue is this neural adjoint that I mentioned. And as you can see, um, so the, the vertical scale is the error. So you want the lowest value here. The neural adjoint perform, performs as good as some of these other inverse approaches, and in some case um, is better. Okay, so as good or better than, than all of these other inverse approaches. Okay, so it works well. Now let's uh, apply this uh, inverse approach to the problem at hand, which is uh, looking for these um, metasurface solutions. Um, what we've done here is a different problem now. This is where we have a, a trillion total combinations. Um, my graduate student did 60,000 numerical simulations and trained this forward model. And the results that I'm showing on this uh, slide are just forward model results. Again, the blue curves are the predictions of this deep neural network. The red curves are the ground truth, which are the numerical simulations. And you can see at least um, from each of these uh, sub panels, we get decent results. Um, some of these are order 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus three. In the bottom right, I'm showing the entire histogram of these results. The mean square error is similar to what we had before, about 0.1% error. And 95% of the data has an MSC of less than two and a half times 10 to the minus three. And again, this is a larger uh, dimensional space. This is a 14 dimensional geometrical space. I mentioned there's a tr over a trillion total combinations. And again, this is very surprising to me because uh, even with 60,000 numerical simulations, we've sampled an extremely small portion uh, of this, this space here. Um, but nonetheless, the neural network can somehow learn the connection between geometry and spectra and get very good uh, solutions. So now I'll show you some results of the inverse model. And first, uh, the well-posed problem. So if we look at a, a well-posed problem, and namely what that means is that we know the geometrical space and the geometrical bounds, so we can simulate uh, a particular geometry uh, that the network has never seen. And we can then uh, simulate that spectra using a numerical solver and then input that spectra into our inverse model and ask it to find a geometry that matches that spectra well. So the uh, numerically simulated target is shown here as the red curves. We feed that into our inverse model, this neural adjoint, and it, it uh, spits out a geometry. And if we re-simulate that geometry, then we get these blue curves. So we get a decent match in terms of mean square error. We have 8.6 times 10 to the minus four. Um, we are missing on some of these peak features here, but by and large, this is a good result. Okay, so it does well with these well-posed problems where we know that a solution exists within the space and that it is a unique solution. Um, but now let me turn to a significantly more challenging problem of this ill-posed problem. Okay, so again, we are back to this energy harvesting uh, issue. We have an external quantum efficiency, which are shown as these open red symbols. I'm just going to replot that uh, in this plot on the right in units of terahertz. So now we switch to frequency, and it's this gray curve. Uh, again, this is the gallium uh, antimony, uh, gallium antimony external quantum efficiency. Okay, so now here, if you think about it, we've trained just on some metasurface. We know that we can have some peak features in the range that we're interested in. Um, but we have no idea if this external quantum efficiency from some semiconductor is going to have a good solution within the space. Okay, so we're absolutely violating the question of existence. Um, we don't know if a good solution, if an, if a solution, a solution exists, and also we don't know if it's going to be a unique solution. A problem with using MSC as a uh, a point for for your loss function is that many uh, similar spectra can give you similar MSEs, right? If the curve goes a little up or a little down and you're using a point by point spectrum to compute an MSE, you can have multiple solutions, okay? So we're violating in this problem, both of these conditions, all right? Nonetheless, we use our neural adjoint uh, to find a good solution and it spits out this blue curve here. And if we just look at MSE, it's decent. It's got about 1% error um, and we find that it works relatively well. Okay, so what we were interested in is, can we do better? Again, this is an ill-posed problem, and we would like to try to understand where our solution lies in this 14-dimensional parameter space, okay? And it's hard to visualize for humans in anything above three dimensions, 
And so 14 dimensions, of course, one wouldn't stand a chance of, of looking where your best solutions are. And so we turn to a dimensionality reduction technique uh, that's called UMAP. Now, what this does is it allows you to reduce it, its dimensionality reduction. So it allows you to take these 14 dimensions and to squash them to two dimensions and to additionally plot some information uh, of your choice on top of that two dimensional data set. And the idea and what this UMAP tries to do is it tries to preserve the global structure, meaning that if you find groupings in this uh, flattened 2D space, they should have some meaning of significance. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. Here I'm plotting this result of UMAP for a 14 dimensional space where we squash it down to two dimensions. And the color map on top of this is mean square error. Okay, so what we want to find is we want to find if we are somehow limited by the geometry. So for example, did our radius somehow limit us? Do we need to use greater radii? Are all of our best solutions jammed up against the boundary of maximum radius, right? So what you can do then is to plot your MSE on this geometrical space, and then you can also plot the edges of your geometry. So for example, if I plot the minimum height that we used in the system, we find that it's pointing to these points. And as you can see, those points have the worst MSC, in fact. So the minimum height was not, in fact, limiting us. If I do the same thing for the maximum height with these uh, blue symbols here, we indeed find that the, the boundary of our maximum height are concomitant with our best solutions in terms of MSC. So now that I know that the height is limiting us, I can now take a slice uh, of that uh, parameter and look at just now height and periodicity. Again, the color map is showing us MSC. And what we find is that uh, in accord with what we saw from UMAP, our worst solutions are these purple colors here that give us the worst MSC. But we see a gradient that's indicating that as we increase height, we're getting better and better solutions. So we're moving along this, this gradient here for MSC. And at our height boundary was uh, 0.6 microns for height. And indeed, all of our best solutions are jammed up against this border. Okay, so this is the MSC that I showed you before, um, where we achieved this 1.06 times 10 to the minus 2. Now, what this gives you the opportunity to do is, since these are ill-posed problems, this is indicating that you were limited by height, and that if you increase the height, you can find better solutions. Okay, so there's a kind of gradient pointing in that direction. So what we did is to expand our height, and then indeed to re-simulate um, these different heights. And as you can see, this gradient continues. You're getting better and better MSCs now. And in fact, you find very good solutions now at the, the limit of your new height boundary, about 0.75 or so. Additionally, we found that the periodicity is starting to hone in on 1.2 for this particular system. So by using this UMAP, we've now expanded our geometrical space and found these much better solutions. If we now use this newly expanded space and look for an inverse solution, we indeed find that we can drop the MSC uh, with this better solution by almost a factor of three. Okay, so this I think will be very important, important for the future of this type of research this is a form of, of active uh, learning where, in principle, what you can do is because of the burden of doing tens of thousands of numerical simulations, this indicates that what you can do is take an initially smaller geometrical space, simulate there, use the neural adjoint inverse approach to find a good solution, but then use UMAP to see where it's pushing you in terms of geometry. You can expand into that new geometrical space. Um, and then kind of re, uh, iterate this process, okay, and overall find uh, better solutions with less computational power uh, at the outset of, of a project. Okay, so that's all I wanted to tell you today. Uh, allow me to conclude. Um, I hope that I've convinced you, and, and I think many people at, at ECMO are working on this, uh, that uh, all dielectric metasurfaces are indeed interesting. They have solved uh, some of the limitations of metal-based metamaterials. And uh, in fact, that's what led us to machine learning or deep learning. Um, we had new problems that arose with the all dielectric approach. I've shown you that we've been able to solve that where conventional optimization techniques had failed. Um, what's more interesting than this forward model is that of the inverse problem. I showed you that for small problems, um, if your parameter space is not too large, that this fast forward dictionary surf uh, a solution uh, it can solve this. 
uh, I've also shown you for large um, geometrical space uh, problems that this neural adjoint can effectively solve that and find very good solutions. No idea if those are optimal, but it can find good solutions for what you're looking for. And uh, overall, I think that machine learning plus metamaterials um, will allow us to achieve even more complex response than what we have achieved in the last 20 years, and that they will be important as uh, combined fields uh, for the next 20 years of research. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have them. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Padilla, for the very exciting talk. Um, so colleagues, it is now time for questions. Um, yes, Alexei, please. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, during uh, such an analysis, um, uh, what I wonder is, uh, for example, if we compare image analysis and physics, uh, we have a much, much more insight into physical problems. And uh, all the history of physics is, uh, is, is a study of some underlying phenomena and uh, a causes what, uh, of this phenomena. So do, do you think uh, maybe uh, a more a, a more a more physical more physical insight could help such an approaches or you think that uh, in future we will uh, need no more physical insight into such optimization problems yeah thank you that's that's this is an excellent question and something that we've been thinking of quite a bit um i mentioned that that neural networks and, and deep learning are, are similar to the scientific method right where you're just plugging along but um, many people in, in our group included are working on trying to use neural networks to uncover physics. And so in, in the examples that I showed you, our output was really in individual um, spectral points. And of course, we know that there are models. Uh, I, I mentioned that, that this is, of course, a causal function. So there's Kramer's chronic, which tells you that this should be a causal, causal function. And so what would be much more interesting would be to learn, uh, for example, the parameters of, of a Lorentz uh, oscillator model that could fit this, right? So what would be better would be to train and connect geometry to Lorentz parameters. And it's been shown that um, through, through many of works that if you could, you could do that, then you are somehow learning some physics about the system that you're studying. And even beyond that, um, people are working on these models where they, they take their neural net and they might shrink it down, uh, let's say in the middle of the neural network to some limited uh, dimensional parameters. And that is some latent representation of the important parameters of the physics problem. So people are, are very much using these neural networks to try to uncover physics. Um, and we are doing the same. Um, it's just an extremely challenging uh, area because generally speaking, the more your neural network is closer to a black box model, the better it performs in terms of all the um, details uh, of the neural network and when it fails and, and so on. There, there are problems to, that we can't get into. And the more you make it closer to physics where you are reducing the dimensionality of it or looking for physics, the more it tends to fail. So it's a very challenging regime, but I, I agree with you completely. And, and it's something that we're interested in and in, in working in, in that area. All right, thank you. Okay, so while we are waiting for the questions from the audience, let me ask a couple of them. Uh, really, maybe I didn't mention that you're, we've been discussing that. Um, so in the very first part of your talk, when you've been discussing the forward problem, uh, you have somehow chosen the, some ready in heights, and then you have somehow chosen the uh, number of points you use to specify the output function. So how did you cho uh, choose these parameters and how stable the result is with, so with respect to the, uh, these, uh, these things? Could you please explain yeah. it? Yes, so we, um, so for the, for the input number of parameters, we initially chose radii and heights. We had this two by two uh, and um, we, there are parameters that one can sweep over and not. So for example, we left periodicity alone. We chose one periodicity and did not have that as a variable input. And so it was, it was not input. And we just felt that it was 
better to reduce the total size of the space. We were, we were kind of new to this and um, we didn't want to have total, uh, we didn't have want to have too many total possible permutations. Um, so, so there was just um, trying to keep the problem initially simple, uh, but we knew that radii and height were of course uh, key uh, to where these modes occur in, 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 in frequency. Um, and then I also showed you how we do know a bit of the physics and that the radii to height was a key parameter um, to input as well. Um, the output, we just wanted a number of spectral points that would represent, be able to represent our output spectrum. You know, we had some particular type of um, features there and we wanted it to be accurate, but not to be so large that that dimension would be significantly larger than the input. Um, people in the literature talk about a problem with dimensionality, where if you're trying to go from a small dimension to a very large dimension, it can be quite difficult. Um, and so we wanted the uh, number of spectral points to be relatively small, but still large enough to have enough resolution uh, to be accurate. Um, th thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Kostya? Uh... Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, so my question is, you showed your na uh, the scheme of your neural network. And uh, in, in the beginning of your talk, you talked that uh, the width, so how many neurons you have in each layer, it is about memorization and your predictive power depends on the number of layers. But at some point in the middle, you reduce it uh, to 500 from 1,500. Yeah, what is the reason for this? Yeah, why you would like to, at some point in the middle of your network, you would like to reduce the number, the memorization property. Yeah. And yeah. Thank you for, for the question. That's, that's an interesting point. So um, these, okay, so the short answer is we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we were following a lot of um, results from the literature where people were doing this sort of thing. And I can tell you that nowadays we do not do that. Um, what we do is our um, neural networks are basically rectangular. They have some constant width and we just are, are adjusting width and depth. We don't do this kind of shrinking anymore. Some people in the literature felt it was important to kind of squash it down because you're kind of getting to some of the important parameters in this, these, with these latent variables that I had mentioned. Um, but in reality, it's, it's just the number of parameters that you need. So we don't do that anymore. We just stick with these rectangular things. And um, it kind of shows you the extreme, um, I think, power of these neural networks that it doesn't matter too much what that architecture looks like. Um, really a key is that the kind of width and depth, one needs to finely tune that for the particular problem that you're looking at. That ends up being more important than the particular architecture that I showed early on in the talk. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it is actually a very, yeah, because uh, I, I read a number of articles and it was always an interesting thing for me, yeah, how, how they choose that, but your answer is a really nice one. And, and another question, if it is possible, yeah, so you talk about that you have some convolution layers inside your neural network, yeah, how you define uh, the design of your neural network, how you choose how many and what, what is the size of these convolution layers to, to make it most efficient or just drop them down and just use uh, deep near without it goes without them. Without them, right. Yeah, so so we in that case needed to use them because um, you, again, if each of your spectral points are independent, you do not get smooth solutions, right? And and we, we already talked about Kramer's product and the importance of having a causal function on the output. Um, so we used it for smoothing. It was necessary for that and to make sure that neighbors were related to each other because of that. Now, um, how we chose the particular parameters, I, I can tell you that, that um, machine learning and deep learning is very much black magic. It, it's, you don't know what those values should be. And so you're just, tr you're just essentially doing parameter sweeps of the parameters that constitute your neural network, right? They're called hyperparameters in the neural networks. You sweep over your neural network hyperparameters until you find a good performing model. And so initially, so we knew that we had to do it to make the, the output smooth, but we didn't know in fact how big to make the, the filter layers and the kernel and all these, all these parameters of those, we initially didn't know what size. 
And so it's just swept over until you get good performance. And, and that's why GPUs are important. Um, and, and, and also I should mention that um, the co-authors on that study are deep learning experts uh, here at Duke University, and they very much helped us and guided us through that process. Okay, th thank you a lot. Very, very, very interesting. Thank you a lot. Thank you. So if, if you don't mind, I, I would ask a couple of more questions from my side uh, while we are waiting for maybe other questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm wondering if you are able, so when solving the inverse problem, are you somehow able to limit your parameter, the output parameter, the, the target parameters of the, the system with the optical properties to some constraints such as a height, minimum distance, and so on and so forth. So is it possible yes. to do so? So what we have done there is the only limit that we had, so the answer is yes, the only limit that we did uh, in this, in the case that I presented, was to limit the boundary of what we trained on. So we trained within some uh, geometrical bounds. We restricted our space to only be within those bounds for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, but in principle, um, if you wanted, you can certainly place those limits. That would go into your loss function. And I think that it, if you had some other reason for, for limiting that space, it can be done in a number of ways. Perhaps the most easily would be to limit um, to, to limit um, it by the loss function. I'll give you one specific example. Um, I mentioned that we train on a grid. So I had showed you the values that we use for radii and heights. In principle, what we find is that you're more accurate if you stay on that grid. It, the neural network trained from specific grid points, right? We didn't, allow, we didn't assign arbitrary or random numbers throughout the minimum and maximum, but we had this grid. And so in principle, what you could do in your inverse model is you can also have a loss function that forces you to stay on the grid, for example. So for whatever reason, if you could only fabricate those values then you could stay on the grid. So there are different ways um, to implement that, I think the loss function is the easiest way to implement what you propose. Thanks. Uh, yes, I see. Question, just a re relevant question I would like to ask regarding your final part when you made these uh, two dimensional mappings, you have seen this some monotonic behavior with, uh, with respect to height or to, I don't know, radius. Uh, but I believe that this is not the general case that sometimes you may have a non-monotonic behavior and two realizations of similar spectra with quite different parameters. Could you please comment on that? Very good point. Yes, this is something that we are concerned about generally. And it, it could very well be that as you move along this geometrical space, you don't have a gradient that's pushing you in some direction for a better solution. Right, it's, these are ill-posed problems. And so you really have no idea. In our particular case, and for the, for the, for this specific case that I presented, uh, all I can say is that we had a gradient to seem to indicate that we should increase our height. Indeed we did. And we found that also an optimal periodicity as well. So that, and, and what we really think is that that is a local optimal solution it's getting us a good match to this external quantum efficiency, but it's probably not the global optimal solution. And there's no way to tell. Um, but in, in our case, it gave us better performance. But you're absolutely right. There's, it may be that one is looking at a problem and there is no gradient, no indication of which direction to move. Yes, I think, uh, thank you. Kostya? Yeah, if I have some time, I actually have a couple, a couple of additional questions. So. I know that uh, for inverse problem, it is very popular to use uh, generative adversarial networks. And can you comment on this? When it is, pos when it is preferable to use this uh, adjoint approach and uh, the gun, gun approach? Mm. I, I, so I, I don't know the answer to that. We did not look at the, the GAN itself. Let me try to go back to the slide. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so, so the models that we looked at uh, are shown here. So I, I can't answer your question. I don't know how it compares to the GAN, um, but we did lurk. Uh, let me just tell you these models that we looked at. Um, so this is called mixture density network. N none of these are GANs to my knowledge. This one is an invertible ne neural network. 
This is a tandem, which yeah, is maybe similar. the tandem, tandem can be a kind of game. So there you can see the performance. Um, this uh, it performed much better than the tandem in every single case. The limitation of the tandem is that you can only get one solution. So as you're doing this iterative approach, you, you can get a very good solution pretty fast. In some cases, if you if you are doing, let me let me rephrase. If you're doing an inverse, um, if you're trying to solve the inverse model and you need real time solutions, so you need the quickest possible good solution, tandem it appears often wins. And one of the you can see some examples where it's it's very good at the outset. Um, but if you can afford to wait a little bit and iterate through this, then you see that the neural adjoint takes over. So it it beats um, in terms of you know, when you when you can wait for a solution, this takes about a second actually to go through these number of iterations. So it's not long, uh, but it's it's maybe not as fast as some of these. I hope I answered your question there. Uh, not yet, yeah, but probably it was the best possible answer here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So and and and, and the next question. So you, you have some uh, a number of uh, hyperparameters, yeah, that you uh, try to. Uh, optimize uh, as you go on. Do you know anything about trying to use some, for example, evolution, evolutionary methods? Yeah, or maybe another, so, or maybe using another uh, neural network to optimize the parameters of neural network you are using on yeah. your research? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I just maybe can show this slide here and mention that Backpropagation is what we have used to find the weights and biases to solve both the forward and then once you have that, of course, this inverse model. But any way that you can find those weights and biases will solve this problem, right? Deep backpropagation is what kind of spawned this current wave of deep learning. But any method where you can learn these weights and biases uh, of the neural network will, will work. And so people are working on genetic algorithms to search a space. Um, in NeurIPS, which again was held last week, there were, I think, a handful of talks, probably like something like five kind of main talks where they talked about different ways, so alternatives to backpropagation. Um, you mentioned one as well. And we do have a current project where, where we're using um, two methods to find these, uh, to train these neural networks. One, um, is instead of gradient descent, we're using gradient ascent, where we just keep crawling along this loss surface until we find very good solutions. Um, the other is we are indeed using a genetic algorithm um, to find to, to solve this this problem of training these neural networks. Um, so the, the short answer is is yes. There are many other approaches. Um, I think backpropagation has some some problems when you train it. Uh, namely, you can have this vanishing gradient where you no longer know how to move along the surface or this exploding gradient. And so in, in problems such as that, then you might seek one of these alternative methods of training your neural network. So probably the, the correct answer depends on, on the problem in the hand. Yeah, it's all just um, luck because you don't know uh, what these this lost surface looks like. These are very highly dimensional surfaces UMAP and other similar approaches allow you to reduce this and, and to maybe get some understanding of that. Um, but again, this is very much black magic. We have algorithms that we've written that just simply sweep the hyperparameters of a neural network. We, we sweep the learning rate, um, we do warm restarts, uh, we, the width and the depth, all of these things are swept over until we find a good solving, a, a good particular architecture that solves the problem. It's all just uh, um, black magic. Okay, hey, thank you a lot. So, okay then, uh, really, I would like to thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and giving a brilliant talk at our uh, optical seminar. So thanks a lot. And just a short announcement. So next week, before we go to vacations, we have an internal attestation of PhD students. And in order to stay updated, just subscribe to our channel and. Uh, and all the uh, what you know so uh, thanks uh, to everyone stay safe and good luck thank you bye bye thank you very much bye